Hello friends, this is part of our online lecture series on political science. In the previous lecture, we were discussing about the saline features of the Constitution of United States of America. And today, we'll be looking at the federal system or how the federal system works in the United States. Let us begin with a view of the political map of United States. As we all know, United States is made up of 50 states or units. Of course, some part is not visible here. To recap a little bit of what we had discussed in the previous lecture, the Constitution of the United States is the oldest written national constitution in the world, which is still in use. It was drafted back in 1787 and signed in the same year and became operationalized or has been enforced since 1789. Now, overview of American federalism. Federalism generally is a system of government in which the same territory is controlled by two levels of government, usually the center and states. Both these national or center government and the states have the power to make laws with certain level of autonomy from each other. They might not be um, independent of each other wholly, but they have certain level of autonomy or independence from its other in exercising those powers guaranteed by the Constitution. In the United States, the Constitution has established a system of dual sovereignty under which the states have surrendered some of their powers to the federal government but also retain many of those sovereign powers. Originally, the American Federation was created by 13 colonies or 13 independent states by surrendering some of their sovereign powers. Now, from 13, the number of states have increased to 50. There are some terms associated with federalism. First, when we talk about unitary system, unitary system are those administrations where there is high centralization of governmental authority. In other words, substantial authority is concentrated in the center or at the national level. But in a confederation, power are highly decentralized with the states or with the units. This is in contrast to the unitary system where there is centralization of power. In other words, confederations are formed by equal entities or sovereign states by delegating some of the power or some of the authorities to a common authority or centralized authority who exercise for the common good of the constituent units. In such cases, the constituent units does not surrender their sovereign authority, but only some of them for their own self-defense or for other agreed terms. But in a federal system, there is distribution of power between the center and states in a more or less equal proportion. Of course, uh, this division of power should be mainly from the constitution. Now here, we can see a chart showing the three types of government. First, in a unitary system, the national government sit at the top and power are delegated from the top to the states. In other words, the states and the local authorities exercise only those power which are delegated by the central government. In short, there is centralized authority or concentration of power at the center. One good example of unitary system is UK. When it comes to federal system, power comes from the people and is being distributed equally between the state and the national government. In other words, there is division of power or distribution of power between the center and states. Example of federal system is United States and India. In a confederation, however, power are derived from the state or the constituent units and it is delegated to the national government. Here, the states, all the constituent units, does not 
surrender their sovereign power. Instead, they delegated some of the uh, some of the common powers so that the national government or the centralized authority can exercise those power for the good of the whole community. One example of confederation is United, uh, sorry, European Union, where most of the European nations are member of the European Union. Recently, Britain has left the European Union because uh, when joining the Union, Britain did not surrender its authority or its sovereign power. So they can be member of the Union and at the same time they can also leave the Union anytime they want. In other words, there is decentralized power or concentration of authority in the hands of the units under confederation. Now there are also two types of federal system, dual federalism and cooperative federalism. In a dual federal federalism, the center and states exercise exclusive power in their respective spheres of jurisdiction. One cannot interfere in the affairs of the other. In other words, there is strict division of power between the center and states. Example of dual federalism is United States. But in a cooperative federalism, both levels of government coordinate their actions to solve national problems. They cooperate, they coordinate, or they work hand in hand to solve common national problems. In this kind of situation, there is division of power, but at the same time, there is also room for interference from one another. One example of cooperative federalism is India, where there is a lot of concurrent lease where both the center and states share equal power. Or in other words, in India, many times the central government will interfere in the affairs of the states because there is no clear-cut division of power between the center and states as in United States. This is an example of dual federalism and cooperative federalism. In a dual fe federalism, authority are clearly divided in layer. The national government at the top, the state government in the middle, and the local government at the bottom. But in a cooperative federalism, authority are mixed, or they are not clearly divided. Sometimes there is chances of overlapping of powers or authority between the three levels of government, particularly the national and the state level. Now let's come to the federal features of the U.S. Constitution. Actually, these federal features of the U.S. Constitution is more or less the same with the saline features of the Constitution of United States. So we will try to look at it as brief as we can. First, the United States has a written constitution. UK has no written constitution or UK has unwritten constitution, but United States, as in India and most of the countries of the world, has written constitution. Second, the United States constitution is one of the most rigid constitutions in the world. It cannot be amended easily. Third, there is division of power between the center and states. In other words, the center and state has their sphere of uh, authority. Fourth, there is supremacy of the constitution. There is no other law which is superior to the constitution. In other words, the constitution of United States, which also include the federal statutes and treaties, as the supreme law of the land. Fifth, there is also separation of powers between the three branches of the government, that is, the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. Here, there is horizontal division of powers, or horizontal separation of powers. One cannot simply interfere in the affairs of the others. But, in the next point, there is also checks and balances, meaning to say, each of these three branches act as a check and balance towards the other. In other words, checks and balances is a government authority that gives each of the branches a degree of control over the actions of the other so that it prevents one branch from becoming too powerful or supreme and also it protects the interests of the minority groups 
and it can also help in coordinating the three branches of the government. Seven, there is power of judicial review which is in the hands of the Supreme Court. In other words, the Supreme Court has the power to interpret the Constitution in terms of legality or in terms of social relevance. Any law passed by the legislature or the executive order issued by the president can be reviewed by the Supreme Court and if it is found that it goes against the spirit of the constitution, such laws or such executive orders can be declared null and void. Eight, the United States has presidential form of government. The president is not simply the head of the state but also uh, all executive power lies with him. And like India, the United States president is both the real head and also the executive head. He is the head of state as well as the head of government. Nine, there is dual citizenship. Dual citizenship means that a person is a citizen of America and at the same time a citizen of the state to which he or she belongs. In India, wherever you go, you are a citizen of India. No matter from which state you belong. But in the United States, they have one citizenship for the whole of the United States and another for the state to which, to which a particular person belongs. Then, there is also popular sovereignty in the United States. Meaning to say, the power or the sovereign authority is derived from the people. In other words, the government is being elected by the people who are in return responsible to them. The people elected their representatives and these representatives form the government and this government is responsible to the people. It is more or less the same with democracy. 11. There is bicameral legislature. In other words, the legislative branch of the government will have two houses. In the United States, the Congress has two houses. There is the House of Representatives and the Senate. It is the same with India, which has Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha as part of the Parliament. 12. The United States has a Republican form of government, meaning to say the head of state is elected by the people. In USA, the president who is the head of the state is being elected by the people every after four years. Similarly, each of the 50 states also have head of state in the form of governor. This is more or less the same with India because India is also a republican country. Finally, we have Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights or Fundamental Rights are those rights which are enshrined in the constitution. Actually, this Bill of Rights was not incorporated in the original constitution of the United States but it was added later by the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. Now let's come to the main point, how federalism works in the United States of America. Federalism, as we know, is a system of government in which sovereign power is constitutionally divided between a central governing authority and its constituent political units. In short, power is distributed between the center and the states. This division of power is based upon democratic rules and institutions in which the power to govern is also shared between national and state government. In other words, federalism is not only about division of powers between the center and states, but also sharing those power at certain level. Now the current scenario of the working of United States, federalism can be analyzed under the following heads. In fact, United States is often taken as a model of modern federalism. In the last 230 years, it might have undergone certain uh, drastic changes, but uh, it remains as one of the ideal federations in the world. Here we will point out seven points. 
division of power, rigid constitutions, republican form of government, respect for territorial integrity, protection against invasion and civil commotion, obligation of states towards federal government, and finally, judicial review. First, when we talk about division of powers, in the United States, powers are constitutionally divided between the center and states, but there are also some other powers which are known as concurrent powers. So as far as concurrent power is concerned, both the states and the center has more or less equal say. Apart from that, there are also residuary powers which are left to the individual states. In India, residuary powers are left with the center, so we have a very strong center. But in the United States, residuary powers are left with the individual states, meaning the state has more power. These residuary powers are nothing but those powers which are not clearly defined in the constitution. However, though the states has more power, they are forbidden from certain subjects like making alliance with foreign powers, coinage, maintaining army, etc. because these subjects are exclusively within the authority of the central government. In this table, we can see how government powers in a federal st uh, structure like United States is being distributed. In the left column, we have federal or national government powers. So first, we have those group of powers which are within the exclusive sphere of the federal government. We also have some prohibited or denied powers. Prohibited or denied power means that these powers are exclusively within the jurisdiction of the states. And we also have those implied or inherent powers. These are those powers which are not clearly defined in the constitution but which are believed to be under the authority of the federal government. And similarly, in the right side, we have state government powers. Here we have reserve powers, which are exclusively meant for the state. And we have prohibited or denied powers, which are exclusively for the federal government. And again, we also have implied or inherent powers. In the middle, we have concurrent powers or shared powers. These powers are equally shared by center and state. In other words, those subjects which comes under the concurrent or shared powers, both the center and state can exercise their power of making law simultaneously. Second, we have rigid constitutions. The Constitution of the United States provides a very rigid procedure for amending the Constitution. For amending the Constitution, proposal has to come from the Congress and should be passed by two-third majority and then should be sent to the state for ratification. Similarly, proposal for amending the constitution can also come from the uh, states to the Congress. Here we have two process. One is proposal for amendment to the constitution can come from the Congress. Here, the Congress has to pass by two-third majority in its house separately. Then it should go to the uh, states for ratification. And here, the states needs to ratify by three-fourth majority. Only then the constitution will be considered amended. Similarly, the states also can propose amendment to the constitution. Here in this case, two-thirds of the states can propose for amendment of the constitution and this proposal should be taken up by the Congress and once the Congress passed by two-thirds majority in its house separately, it has to be sent back to the state for ratification. Here again, for ratification, the states need to ratify by three-fourth majority. In short, the amend amendment procedure of the Constitution of United States is very rigid. And that is why, in the past 230 years, the Constitution of United States has been amended only 27 times. In the case of India, in the past 70 years since 1950, the constitution has been amended more than a hundred times. Now, republican form of government. As we have already mentioned, the federal government is republican in form, meaning the president is elected. Not only the president, but also 
The federal government guarantees republican form of government to every state. Each of the states should have a governor as the head of state. Respect for territorial integrity. This means that the federal government has been required to respect the territorial integrity of the states. In other words, the Supreme Court described the United States as an indestructible union composed of indestructible states. This means that both the state and the union cannot be destroyed or cannot be divided. In other words, the federal government cannot alter the territorial integrity of the states. It has no power to alter the boundary of the states or create new one out of the existing states without the consent of the affected states. In case there has to be new states or in case new boundary has to be drawn, it should be only after the consent or after the states concerned approve it. The federal government cannot simply uh, redraw the boundary of the states. Protection against invasion and civil commotion. The federal government is responsible for protection of the states against external invasion. In case the territorial integrity of the states are threatened, it is the responsibility of the federal government to protect the states against such threat. It can also provide assistance to crush domestic violence or civil commotion in case the states concern seek help from the center. But there are also situations where the federal government can interfere without permission of the state concern, such as in case there is chances that federal laws are being violated or there is chances that national properties are being destroyed or endangered. In such cases, the federal government can send even its troops to protect the federal laws and national properties. Obligation of states towards federal government. As the federal government is responsible to the state, the state are also obligated to conduct certain functions. For example, the states are obligated to conduct elections for federal offices like the president and the members of the Congress. That means the members of the Senate as well as House of Representatives. The state should also sometimes conduct elections for the state level and local level offices. Now, lastly, we have judicial review. This power of judicial review is wasted in the hands of the Supreme Court and the Federal Courts. In other words, the Supreme Court and the Federal Courts have the power of judicial review on any law enacted by the legislature, not only the legislature but also the executive order issued by the President. The Supreme Court also acts as the guardian of the Constitution and fundamental rights of its citizens. In case any authority, including the legislature and the executive, threaten the constitution or violate the constitution or the fundamental rights of the citizens, the Supreme Court should come in, should interfere to protect both the constitution and the fundamental rights of the citizen. This is the end of our lecture for today. In the next lecture, we will be discussing about separation of power and checks and balances. Thank you for today. Please leave your comment so that we will improve in the next lecture. Thank you.